In the last video, we looked at how the state of our system changes with each application of the subroutine. And we found that the angle between our state and the state S prime increases by an amount two theta with each application, where theta is the angle between the uniform superposition and S prime. So if we call the angle between our state after our applications of the subroutine and S prime phi r, then phi r is equal to two r plus one times theta, where r again is the number of times we have applied the subroutine. Because psi r lives in the plane spanned by S prime and X star, we can write it as a linear combination of S prime and X star. The coefficient in front of S prime is cosine phi r, and that means the coefficient in front of X star is sine phi r. So the probability of finding the system to be in the state x star after r applications of the subroutine is sine squared phi of r. And we want to maximize this probability. Maximizing sine squared phi of r is the same thing as maximizing sine phi of r. And sine looks something like this. At 0, it's equal to 0. Uh, at pi over 2, it's equal to 1, and then it returns to 0 at pi. So if phi of r is equal to pi over 2, then sine phi of r is equal to 1. And that means the probability of finding the system to be in the state x star upon measurement is also equal to 1. And that's because the system was in the state x star before measurement. That's what phi of r equals pi over 2 means. So our goal is to get phi of r as close to pi over two as possible, because this maximizes the probability of finding the system to be in the state x star upon measurement. Phi of r is equal to two r plus one times theta. So we just set this equal to pi over two and solve for r. The only problem is that we currently don't know what theta is. Fortunately, it's pretty easy to figure out. Theta is the angle between S prime and the uniform superposition S. So that means cosine theta is equal to the length of this vector here. And this vector is actually the projection of S onto S prime. Or in other words, the S prime projection operator acting on S. So we see that its length is equal to the inner product of S prime and S. So cosine theta is equal to the inner product of S prime with S. And we can figure out what this is too. S prime and S have two to the n minus one components in common when we write them as a linear combination of the computational basis states. S has all of them and S prime is missing the X star component. For S prime, all of these basis states have coefficient one over root two to the N minus one. And for S, all of these components have coefficient one over root two to the N. So the inner product of S prime and S is just this product or root two to the N minus one over two to the N. And this is a little ugly. Sine theta turns out to be prettier. Uh, sine theta is just root one over two to the n. And you can see this because cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta has to equal one. So the conclusion is that theta is equal to the inverse sine of root one over two to the n. So phi of r, which is equal to two r plus one times theta, equals two r plus one times the inverse sine of root one over two to the n. And again, we want this to be as close to pi over two as possible. Now the inverse sine is a little messy to work with, but if n is large, then the argument to the inverse sine is small. For example, if n is equal to 20, then one over root two to the n is one over two to the 10, or one over 1,024, which is smaller than 0 0.001. And with arguments this small, the small angle approximation is pretty accurate. So for n much bigger than 20, 
sine of root one over two to the n is approximately equal to root one over two to the n. And this is the same thing as saying that the inverse sine of root one over two to the n is approximately equal to root one over two to the n. So phi of r is approximately equal to two r plus one times root one over two to the n. And we're going to set this equal to pi over two and solve for r. So r equals pi over two times root two to the n, uh, subtract off the one, and finally divide by two. And since we're considering large values of n, this negative one piece is quite small compared to root two to the n. Again, for example, if n equals 20, then root two to the n is equal to 1024. So the minus one isn't carrying much weight. So we find that when r is equal to pi over four times root two to the n, phi of r is approximately equal to pi over two, which means we'll have a pretty high probability of measuring our system to be in the state x star upon measurement if we apply the subroutine about root two to the n times. And that's the long awaited punch line to Grover's algorithm. We only have to apply the subroutine about root two to the n times, which means about root two to the n queries of the oracle. Whereas in the classical case, we had to query the oracle up to two to the n times. So why is this so important? Um, let's say n equals 30. So there are two to the 30 possible values of x star. And let's say each query to the oracle takes one second. So in the classical case, it's possible that we have to query the oracle two to the 30 times. This is gonna take two to the 30 seconds if each query takes one second. There are pi times 10 to the seventh seconds in a year. That means pi times 10 to the ninth seconds in a hundred years or roughly pi times two to the 30th seconds in a hundred years. And that means two to the 30th seconds is a little more than 30 years. So if we run a classical algorithm to solve this problem with n equals 30, in the worst case, it could take more than 30 years. Now in the quantum case, we only have to apply our subroutine pi over four times root two to the n times, or pi over four times two to the 15th times. And that's pi over four times two to the 15th queries to the oracle, or pi over four times two to the 15th seconds. There are 3,600 seconds in an hour, or 36,000 seconds in 10 hours, and that's larger than two to the 15th. So the total amount of time spent querying the oracle is less than 10 hours in the quantum case. So the difference between the quantum algorithm and the classical algorithm is the difference between working one eight hour day or working an eight hour day for every day of your life.